we thank you for this evening. We ask that you would open our hearts up to receive from your word and open your word up that we may receive from it, Lord. Pray that we would be found to be doers of your word and not hearers only. And give us many opportunities this week to minister to others, even as you are pouring into us this evening. We thank you so much in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I read an article a couple of days ago, and in that article it was speaking about this, something that has been discovered by astronomers um, at uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center, which I have no clue exactly where that is. But anyway, they, they discovered this particular white dwarf star in the constellation of Centaurus. They have discovered that in the center of that, in that core, there is a 3,000, or they believe, I'm not sure how they discover these things. I guess they read light waves coming back or something like that and analyze those somehow. But they've discovered or decided that there is a 3,000 kilometer wide core of diamond. And it weighs 2.27 thousand trillion trillion tons. And just to make that a little clearer, that's 10 billion trillion trillion carats. The value of uh, that diamond obviously is incalculable. The biggest jewel on earth is one of the British crown jewels. It's the 530 carat star of Africa. The gem was cut from the largest diamond ever found on earth, a 3100 carat stone. What would the largest diamond in the world be worth? Now, what kind of security would it require if you had it? How would you treat it? Today's study is about who Israel is to God and also about who we are to God. And there are a lot of things in this that are, well, there's a lot of things in the world. You know, we, we're, I was talking about outside, we're way outside of the world, and not even sure how these astronomers figure this out and come to this, how, how much it would weigh and all this. I had no clue how they do that. But there are things in this world that are quantifiable to us, yet are still priceless, prized, or precious. White truffle. It goes for $5 a, a gram, $2,000 per pound. Saffron. Is five that well over five thousand dollars a pound? Iranian beluga caviar is one thousand dollars an ounce. Rhino horn is twenty five thousand per pound, and who knows how many years in pit in prison, <laughs> right? Plutonium is four thousand dollars per gram. Tarfite which is more than a million times scarcer than diamonds, is $2,400 per carat. Tritium, which is used in self-illuminating exit signs, of which there are about 2 million in the United States, is $30,000 per gram. Now, our, our exit signs are not self-illuminating, so before you start taking those things down <laughs> to cash them in, and finally, we have the diamond, of which a colorless one-carat diamond can cost more than $65,000 per gram or $13,000 per carat. Now, as valuable as the Star of Africa or the Hope Diamond may be on this earth, to our Father, our Heavenly Father, we are much more precious. Our scripture for today is about Israel, and while we can generally read what God has said about Israel and relate it to his feelings about Christians as well. We need to be careful that we don't take things that God specifically put toward Israel as being for Christians. A good example is something that's really popular these days, the, the Shemitah, or the sabbatical year. Um, it, it's become a really hot topic with Christians today. There's observations made people kind of going back and looking through the past decade or couple of decades um, of every seven years of a pattern of things happening, whether that's some kind of financial disruption here in the United States or, or 
uh, disasters that have, natural disasters that have occurred here in the United States. And, and they say, well, these things happen, seem to happen every seven years. Um, it seems to me that it's, these things happen <laughs> just about every year. But um, th I guess quantifiably it seems that they happen every seven years. Now, one side of this, I absolutely believe that with increased immorality in this nation, that we are seeing uh, God's hand, God continue to withdraw his hand from this nation. On the other side, the Shemitah was uh, a part of the Mosaic Covenant. And that Mosaic Covenant was specifically given to and agreed to by Israel. So to say that the Shemitah applies to the United States is to say that we are somehow bound to a covenant that was made between God and Israel. Now that's dangerously close to replacement theology. That's just an example of how we should be careful not to take what is specifically between God and Israel and try to apply it to ourselves. Yes, the Bible says we are grafted in. But we are also told that we are not bound by the Mosaic Law. So what do we do with Old Testament statements about Israel being special to God in that case? Do we say, well, that counts for Christians too, but the Mosaic Covenant does not? Well, I think the best thing to do is to go to specific scriptures that demonstrate, uh, or dem demonstrably is the word I'm searching for, tell us, how God views Christians. Now, let, let's see how God views us in Scripture. Looking at 1 Peter 2.9. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Galatians 4, 6 through 7 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And, of course, as we'll be talking about this Sunday, continuing in our study of Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, 16 through 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That's just a few of many scriptures that we find in the New Testament that speak of us being precious in God's sight. Now, looking back at 1 Peter 2.9, which was that very first one that we looked at there, we, we observe that Peter is actually quoting from the Old Testament. It's, it's actually from two Old Testament passages. If I remember correctly, it's from Exodus, and it's also from Deuteronomy. So we find that in saying that Christians are precious to God, we're not robbing, we're not stealing from Israel, but recognizing from the Scripture that we are special to the Lord. There are many other Scriptures which speak of our relationship through Christ to the Father. We are indeed precious to Him. We are His possession, His special treasure. He chose us and picked us as being precious to Him so that we could be His light in the darkness of the world. We have all heard that saying that diamonds are a girl's best friend. But what is it that makes them so special? Well, here's some characteristics of diamonds. They reflect the light that is shined on them. They never create their own light. They reflect the light that shined on them. They have many facets that reflect the light differently. They are created by years of pressure and heat, without which they would just be a lump of coal. They are the hardest known jewels on earth. They can withstand a lot of trouble. They will last a very, very, very long time. They are carefully chosen. They have a high value. They're purchased at a high price. And they are carefully guarded and protected because of their value. Now, as the special treasures of God, we have similar characteristics. Reflecting the light of Christ, Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Unless we suppress Him, we naturally reflect His light.
and we better reflect His light when we get closer to Him. We all reflect His light a little differently. Just as each facet of a diamond reflects light in a different way, each of us shows God's light in the world in a different way through the gifts and the talents that God has given us. We're formed under pressure. The tribulations, the trials, and the tests that we endure serve to shape and form us and conform us to the likeness of Christ. We're tough. We can stand up to anything the enemy throws at us. We have the strength that comes from being God's special treasure. We are more than conquerors through Christ. We will live forever as God's special treasures with Him. We are eternal creatures. We will continue to shine God's glory for all ages as we live with Him for all eternity. We are specially chosen by God. He chose each one of us to be His children. We've been purchased at a very high price. That price was the blood of Jesus Christ. We're carefully guarded and protected by our Father because we are precious to Him. Our Father watches over us day, each day, day by day, protects us in ways that, that we're probably not even aware of. And He does it because we are valuable to Him. The Lord fights for us. He protects us from our enemies. So with these things in mind, that Israel is precious to God, that Christians are precious to God. Let's dig in to chapter 14, and we'll start, of course, with verse 1. It says, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves, nor shave the front of your, your head for the dead. For you are a holy people to the Lord, to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people's who are on the face of the earth. This chapter begins by telling the people of Israel that they are the children of God. This implies that the laws that are given here, these commandments, these ordinances that are given here, are a part of that special status. Moses is continuing his instructions to Israel for when they are in the land. They would come into contact with pagan nations, and they would be exposed to those pagan practices. And unlike the, the wilderness march, they wouldn't be just moving on. They would be settling there. Now God would tell Israel, hey, you guys are supposed to move everybody else out. You're supposed to take the land. But would Israel completely do that? No. And God knows that. And so he, he's saying to them, if you're going to live in this land, really live in this land, enjoying my blessings, then these are the things that you need to do. And this is one of those things. It, it was important then that Moses remind Israel and, and even solidified instructions that were given before regarding how they behaved in the land. And that was, again, so that they would be able to live lives sanctified to God in the midst of temptation. Now, part of being reminded of part of that is being reminded of who they are. Moses reminds them in these first two verses. Now, because of sentence structure in Hebrew, verse one, if we were to read it in Hebrew, would actually read something like this: "Children, you are to Yahweh your God." And of course, Yod Hey Vav Hey would be what what would be written there. It's the covenant name of God, which nobody's exactly sure how to pronounce, but. We hear it sometimes expressed as Yahweh or Jehovah. Now, this, this, the way that that reads in Hebrew, it, it, it does more than imply an extra, extraordinary relationship. It makes that relationship a matter of fact. Children, they are to God. Children need to be nurtured and guided, made aware of rules that will benefit them to follow. Children are also loved and valued. In the Old Testament, God is specifically called the father of the nation of Israel. But the use of father in reference to God is also somewhat rare in the Old Testament. And that itself may have been to differentiate Israel's relationship with God from the pagan idolatry of the region. 
Now in the New Testament, however, we find that Jesus uses the term Father 65 times in the first three Gospels and more than 100 times in the Gospel of John. Jesus used the term, the term Abba, which is the Aramaic form of the Hebrew Av. That speaks of a personal relationship. It's no surprise then that Father was used by his disciples and by the church on down through the generations. This is not a, a change of relationship because God is a father to Israel, but it becomes inclusive to Gentiles who, though, who through Jesus are partakers of that same relationship. That relationship between Israel and God, which meant that they were to be separate from the world, is a relationship that is made perfect through Christ, through whom we have been welcomed in, into an intimate relationship with the Father. Now, the Hebrew word for sanctified or consecrated is kadash. It refers to one thing being made separate from something, separated also to something else. Now, there are some things that a child of God should be involved in. God makes it clear through his Bible that those who are his should be distinct from the world and distinct in belonging to him. The Greek word that is translated in Scripture as cleanse <laughs> has kinship with that Hebrew word kadash, or it's depending on how you how the the Hebrew word how how that word appears within a sentence, how it's conjugated, it could be kadosh, kadash, kadash. So you may have seen it different ways, but that Greek word that that, that shares in kinship with the Hebrew word there. Um, is often used by Jesus to speak of being separated to God from the world. And, and if you look at the etymology of that Greek word, then we find that the root word of it is even more telling. It speaks of purification by fire, being Levitically clean, and also being morally clean. Now these are three things that are often overlooked or undertaught when people do teach the Bible. Often they're discarded kind of as being Old Testament concepts, saying the Old Testament was for then, and we can just toss aside those things now. That is instead of recognizing that it's from God, and it's good in its purpose in leading us to Christ. And then though we, we enjoy the fulfillment of the law in Christ, the Torah remains good, and we are conformed through it to the image of Christ, being washed in the fullness of the Word of God. In that conforming, we are being sanctified as bodies are presented a living sacrifice, and we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now, that you guys probably recognize as, as being that process that Paul spoke of in Romans chapter 12 through verses 1 and 2. But so often, you know, verse 2 is left out of that whole thing. Which is unfortunate because it speaks of the, the fruit of those things, the holiness part, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, it's, it's living it out is what it speaks of, which is something <coughs> those who go too far on the law side of things tend to place above Christ. And those who go too far on the grave side of things tend to ignore. We should not run all the way over to one side, and say, I'm saved by grace and can now live a hedonistic lifestyle doing whatever I want, even if God said it was wrong. And, and we should also not run all the way to the other side and say, well, grace is Christ plus keeping the law. But when it comes to salvation for a believer to place dependence on the law and even for, for them to say, hey, it's Christ plus this part of the law or it's, it's Christ plus this other part of the law. That, that's to distrust the grace of God. And to use grace as an excuse for continued sin is an abuse of the grace of God. So instead of running to extremes in either direction, we abide in Christ, who is the Word made flesh, who is the fulfillment of the law, or put another way, we surrender ourselves to the will of God in Christ. Now, in Acts 27, which you guys probably remember, it hasn't been that long ago since we were there. In Acts 27, when Paul was on board a boat headed for Rome, a storm 
a terrible storm struck that boat. And the boat was being just torn apart in this storm. The ship's crew, they threw overboard all the stuff they had that they had brought onto the ship so that, that ship would be more buoyant. The crew themselves were going to try and leave that ship. When Paul went to the soldiers, Roman soldiers, and said that, hey, unless they stay on the ship, they will be lost. It's a very interesting picture of our abiding in Christ. And while it may you know, freak some people out to say this, the Bible speaks of both the security of the believer and the removal of unfruitful branches. And to be honest, because the Bible does not draw any hard line between the two, I'm okay with leaving that up to God and, as for myself, just simply abiding in Christ, which means I throw everything else overboard and just remain on the ship, believing that my Lord told me I was secure in His hands forever and ever. Now, our abiding in Christ during the storm, that makes our relationship with the Savior that much more vivid and attractive to others. When we are willing to let go of those things that keep us from being comfortable in that fulfillment of the law that is Christ, whether that's finances or, or toys or gadgets or opinions or strong beliefs regarding non-salvation related doctrine, letting go is a good thing because most of the time all those things that we want to carry around with us just crowd out God. Whether that thing may be a, a something as simple as, as a toy, an electronic device, or an opinion. 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 15, says, Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, and wanting is on the way out, but whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Now, back in our chapter, in these first few verses, we find a prohibition against cutting the flesh and shaving the head, as well as tearing out the hair for the dead. Now, this should not be looked on as a prohibition against marking the skin as we see a lot of people doing today, unless it's done to worship and honor false gods. These things were practiced by the pagan nations that would be around Israel, including the Amorites and the other nations there. And, and it was practices that they would do when they were mourning for the dead. And it was also done to protect themselves from death. They mourned for the dead as, as people who had no hope. They also lived in fear of death as those with no hope. But it was to be different with Israel because they were children of God and had hope. God did not forbid mourning for those who have died. Abraham, he wept when Sarah died. All of Israel wept when Moses and Aaron passed. The prohibition was against mourning like those who had no relationship with the Father and thus no hope. Now, I've performed many funerals. Most, pe most were people who knew the Lord. A few were the funerals of people who did not know the Lord. And I can tell you that there is a marked difference in those who mourn for the passing of the saved versus those who mourn for the passing of the unsaved. Among Christians today, there is something wrong if our mourning is just like that of the of the rest of the world, of the unsaved. Paul says in First First Thessalonians four thirteen, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Let's keep going. Verse three. You shall not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals which you may eat the ox, the sheep, the goat the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. And you may eat every animal with cloven hooves, having the hoof split into two parts, and, and that chews the cud among the animals. Nevertheless, of those who, that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, you shall not eat, 
such as these, the camel, the hare, the rock hyrax. For they chew the cud, but do not have cloven hooves. They are unclean for you. Also the swine is unclean for you, because it has cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud. You shall not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. I imagine after, after this list, list was giving pig costumes were popular among many animals. There's a, outside of Israel, somewhere between Israel and Israel, between Jerusalem and Nazareth, there is a truck stop that has absolutely the best cheeseburger I've ever had. The truck stop's horrible. The outside of it smells terrible. But when you go inside and you order, it is so good. Um, kosher laws forbid an observant Jew from combining meat and dairy like you would in a cheeseburger. So you go to a McDonald's in Israel, you're not going to order a quarter pounder with cheese. But you can go to this truck stop just outside of Nazareth. <laughs> Which is probably why the cheeseburgers there are so good, because you've gone all this time without one, and then you finally get one. But so, so why, why is there this thing about not having meat and dairy together like you want a cheeseburger? Well, because you don't know if the burger you're eating from is the child of the cow which produced the milk for the, for the cheese. And they're not going to risk the possibility of violating God's commandment. And, and, you know, in a way that, that sounds like, you know, what, what are the odds <laughs> that could be the case, you know? So it sounds a little silly, like we're carrying things a little too far. But a lot of these regulations that God gave his, his people protected them from plagues and diseases that other nations and cultures dealt with. Um, the Talmud, part of the oral law, it contains detailed instructions on how food is to be prepared um, kosher or fit for consumption. There's many other examples of that. Um, circumcision, not eating pork. Um, it, it, you know, you're protected from parasites by not eating pork. Not e eating shellfish and, and bottom feeders. You know, because of the they eat the stuff that settles to the bottom. And you know, uh, not eating blood because disease is easily contracted from the blood. It is, it, it's good to follow God's rules. You know, do parents give their children rules because they want to subjugate their kids? No, <laughs> at least most don't. Parents give their kids rules and discipline for their own good and their own protection. That's what God does. And, and yes, we're not under the law. We are under grace. And yes, we can freely eat a cheeseburger we can have pork and we can have fried catfish. Galatians 3, 23-25 says, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Galatians 5.18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And well, we wonder, well, doesn't that just lead to out-of-control lawlessness? Well, Paul understood that we would be asking that, and so he said in Galatians 5.16, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Romans 6.1-2 Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so if we take this freedom and, and run with it to the point of robbing ourselves of a, a meaningful, rich relationship with our Heavenly Father, we're doing great harm to ourselves. Grace means that we are not subject to the penalty for failing to uphold law. It does not mean that we shouldn't love God's Word. Now, the first verse of this section we just read says, You shall not eat any detestable thing. That sounds like a pretty good command to me. I don't care for Brussels sprouts. I don't eat Brussels sprouts. They're detestable to me. 
Yet there are those people who do bless their hearts. I, I don't understand it because they're horrible. Let's be reminded while we're studying these things not to be legalistic by choosing a, a prohibition that agrees with us so that we find it easy to keep and then point fingers at those who don't keep that same prohibition. We might say, I know that grace supersedes the law, yet I'm going to try to win God's favor by the keeping of this particular law or, or this particular kosher diet or whatever. And I think other people should too. Now Peter may have been thinking something similar to that when he, at that agape feast of the church in Antioch, when he, he moved from the Gentile table to sit with the legalists from Jerusalem when they arrived. The problem was that his actions communicated that the gospel involved winning God's approval instead of receiving his approval by grace. It also communicated to others a need to win God's approval. Essentially, that means salvation is the gospel plus something else. And that's, that is not the gospel. And, and since Paul said, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed, any gospel that adds to or takes away from his gospel, God's gospel as he gave it, is a detestable thing to him. Now, in regards to diet, you know, I personally live by, thank you, Lord, for blessing under grace what was cursed under the law. I like sausage. I like pork chops and, and all those things. I'm sure Peter thought that he was being diplomatic by moving to the legalist table, but he communicated approval to the legalists and approval earning to the Gentiles. And Paul called him out on it. It sounds like there's some kind of line that we have to walk or some kind of balance we have to try and keep, but it's really not because our approval with God is in Christ alone. We may still have opinions, and we can respect one another's opinions so far as they do not bend or alter the gospel. My greater point here is that it's not based on our opinion. It's based on God's authority. It's not what we think. It's what God says. Even though we are under grace in Christ, we desire to please God. The grace that saves us changes us. We observed this past Sunday that Augustine, an early church father, said, Who can be good if not made so by loving? Love God and do as you please. Now he could say that because he knew that when you love God, what pleases you will be what pleases God. Grace has put us in touch with the love of God, and his love has changed us. Christians have not lived up to that very well, though. We understand that we have been saved by grace, but then we act as though the rest is up to us. Some have even taught that we are forgiven at the time of salvation, but if we mess up after that, then there's no hope left. But I'm here to tell you that Scripture says we live by grace every moment of every day. Now, the phrase here, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hoofs, it means that the hooves must be completely divided. An animal with hooves that are completely divided was considered clean if it also chewed the cud. Chewing the cud means an animal regurgitates part of its food back into its mouth and chews it again like a, like a cow does. Now, th those two criteria made it easy to tell which animals were clean and which were unclean for food. For instance, a pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud, so it is unclean. A camel, which does chew the cud but does not have a divided hoof, is also unclean. Unclean animals were pigs, camels, rock badgers, um, not honey badgers, rock badgers, also known as hyraxes, rabbits, and some others. Clean animals were oxen, cattle, sheep, goats, deer, and Twinkies. I'm kidding about the Twinkies. There are also some others there. You guys know why, why a cow chews its cud? <laughs> 
Uh, they're just trying to find their gum. It's horrible. The, the, Torah descri- <laughs> the Torah describes forbidden food as being abominations. It's interesting to me <laughs> that, the, that the phrase there is actually inclusive. Any detestable thing is said by Jewish sages to prohibit anything that has been made permissible through a transgression. For instance, if a person sinned by causing a mark or blemish on a firstborn animal so that it would be disqualified to use as an offering, the animal is then considered an abomination and may not be eaten. Now that would discourage causing a blemish because it would really avail nothing to that person who did so. It re, this, this reinforces to us that God is to be taken at his word. This, this should be no problem because his word proves itself to us to be trustworthy. The Torah talks about only ten species of kosher land animals that have split hooves and chew their cud. And the few animals that are non-kosher because they only meet one of those criteria. It, it's noteworthy that there are no other species that have only one of these characteristics than what the Bible tells us. This shows us that the Bible is divine. A human would not risk being refuted by the discovery of other animals that were not known to him at the time. That illustrates to us that this scripture is God-inspired. Now, grace is wonderful, but it's, it's not to be abused at the expense of others who may view it as a representation of Christian hypocrisy and a reason for them to reject Christ. The divided hoof is a picture for us of the way a Christian should walk, separated, in the world but not of it. Remember Romans 12, 1-2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How is our mind transformed? Well, that's where the chewing of the cud comes in. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Chewing the cud is a picture to us of meditating on the word of God. Meditate is a word that has really been stolen from Christianity by the New Age movement. So don't feel weird or, or awkward in saying that you meditate on God's word. Meditation is chewing. It's like the graphic picture of a, of a, a cow in that process of, of mastication, bringing up uh, previously digested food uh, for, to, to continue grinding it and, and, and continue breaking it down for assimilation. Meditation is, is pondering various thoughts by mulling them over in the mind and in the heart. It's a process of, of mental food, what we might, we might call it thought digestion. You know, chewing upon a, a thought deliberately and thoroughly and thus providing a, a vital link between uh, theory and action. God speaks to us through his word, yet sometimes we might just skim through the Bible. And, and when we do that, we get very little from it. We need a time of reading and pausing to think about what we've read, to let God speak to us through it, even when it's convicting to us. And that's, that's true beyond church. There should be periods in our lifetimes that we have set aside when we're in God's Word and, and we're chewing the cud, we're meditating on His Word. Let's continue with verse 9. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. All clean birds you may eat. But these you shall not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon, and the kite after their kinds. Every raven after its kind. The ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, the hawk, after their kinds. 
the little owl, the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the fisher owl, the stork, the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe and the bat. Fish that had uh, both scales and fins were considered clean. There was no stipulation to refrain from fish taken out of salt water or fresh water. Fish like catfish that feed on the bottom, eating the, the garbage and the slime from other water creatures, they, they were unclean. And they actually have no scales. Now, bottom feeders like clams or oysters, as well as, as eels, were considered also to be unclean. There are a couple of good reminders here for us. First, as Christians, we shouldn't be content with consuming the garbage of the world, but we should desire the clean food of God. The next time that you're in a Christian bookstore, take a hard look around and you will see why much of the United States is confused about what Christianity is. Go to a regular bookstore and look in the Christianity section and you will see the exp that the expression of, of what Christians are consuming in, in this whole confused mass of books uh, that are putting out heretical doctrine and, and Gnostic gospels and these things. False teaching is not confined to the shelves of Barnes & Noble. You also find it on the radio, on television, in Christian music, and on the internet, and in pulpits. Second, realizing the extent of the onslaught against clear biblical teaching, we are reminded that if we are to stand firm for the gospel as God gave it, we will need to put on the full armor of God. In Scripture, a fish's scales were often symbolic of armor, and in this case, we might be reminded of the importance of putting on our armor each and every day. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says, My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Immerse yourself in the word of God and in prayer. When Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness of Judea, Satan twisted scripture in order to tempt him. Jesus countered with the truth. False teaching has, and it will continue, to trick many. And our best protection against it is to search the scriptures daily and know what the Bible says. There are a lot of things that are counter to what the Bible teaches, just clamoring for your attention looking for ways into your heart, your best defense against anything that is contrary to the Word of God is to be intimately familiar with what God's Word says. Verse 11. Well, we already read past that, didn't we? Where did we leave off? We left off with uh, 19. It says, every, Also every creeping thing that flies is unclean for you. You shall, they shall not be eaten. You may eat all clean birds. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gates that he may eat it. Or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So there's... No recipe given for distinguishing clean versus unclean birds, except that all the birds in that list that we read previously were unclean. We might notice that all of those birds listed are birds of prey, and they are carrion eaters. You may also notice that there are a lot of unclean animals of all kinds and categories, and yet... Some of these animals you would never have guessed would be considered unclean by God, except that he said they were. We should likewise be reminded that sin and defiling things don't always announce themselves as such. Instead, we need to be discerning. And you might be surprised that discernment is not just, commi not just commended in Scripture, but commanded in Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Discernment is important if we are to test all things and hold fast to what is good. Now, how do we test what is good? 
God hasn't left us in the dark. He's not left us without guidance, but he has given us everything we need to discern every circumstance in life. And it's all in his word. There's a thing called biblical discernment. And contrary to what some might think, it doesn't mean discerning what parts of the Bible we want to adhere to and what parts we want to throw out. Biblical discernment is the ability to think biblically about all areas of life. We're able to do that when we take time to measure things by the rule of Scripture. And when we do that, when we take that time to measure everything by the rule of Scripture, then we will not be as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, the trick by the trickery, trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Verse 19 introduced another category of flying things, insects. According to Leviticus 11, those flying insects which were clean were those with jointed legs above their feet. These included locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. And that is not the theme for our next agape feast. Now, unless they're fried, I guess. <laughs> because it's all fried food, right? <laughs> now, those, those final verses from, what, about 21 on down, they seem a little bit out of order from the pace of this chapter of this or this section of our chapter. You know, it almost seemed kind of stuck in there. But I think the Holy Spirit did it on purpose in order to frame out this section of scripture. You know, we began with that idea of separation, both from the world and se both separated from the world and separated to God. And it's also what this section ends with. You know, thus framing it out you see, this idea of, of not mixing dairy with meat, it has a lot to do with what we were talking about. Israel not adopting the pagan practices of the nations she comes in contact with. The cooking of a goat in his mother's milk was a part of a pagan fertility ritual that was practiced by those pagan nations. Israel was to remain separate. God had told Israel that they were to welcomed the stranger, and they were to treat the stranger well. In some laws, the stranger would need to agree to observe, but he was permitted to eat non-kosher meat. If an animal died of natural causes, instead of being slaughtered, the Israelite was not to eat of it. Now, Jewish scholars say that while they were not supposed to consume meat that has not been kosher slaughtered, it was not called an abomination. Not in the way that eating non-kosher creatures were in those previous scriptures. Instead, it's forbidden to Israel because it is not fitting food for a holy people. The great uh, composer Bach, he said, All music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where this is not remembered, there is no real music, but only a devilish hubbub. Bach always headed his compositions with the initials J.J. The letters stood for Yesu Yuva. It means Jesus help me. He ended them with S.D.G. Those letters stood for Sole Dia Gratia, which means to God alone be the praise. The way Bach framed his music is the way we should live our lives by the power of Christ to the glory of God. Because a Christian is sanctified as belonging to the Lord, there are some things that a Christian should do. There are some things a Christian should not do. There are some things that a Christian can do, but is not befitting a Christian to do. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, All things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Now, how do we do that? 
Israel, even with all of God's instruction, had a very difficult time not doing those things that the other nations did. Well, stick with me here. For the next few Sundays, as we study Romans 8, we're going to be speaking a lot about grace. We set the tone this past Sunday by observing in verse 9 of Romans 8, where it said, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. There Paul recognizes a very important truth, that we act according to what we know we are. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, as we said before, how do we discern what things are, we are free to do, but what things are not befitting for us to do? How do we live pleasing to God in all things? Well, the way to live pleasing to God is to see yourself as He sees you. Someone who sees themselves themselves the way that God sees them will not want to live the way that those who are under judgment live. The way to break the power of the most vicious and most evil habit is to see yourself the way God sees you. Because then you begin to act that way. Let's stop there for tonight and pray. Lord, we thank you for speaking with us this evening. Lord, it is uh, incredible how deep, how wonderful your word is and how it speaks into every area of our life. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We also thank you for your, your guidance, Lord. We thank you for the things that that you say we are not to be involved in, even though we are under grace. Lord, I pray that each one of us here this evening would stay grounded and rooted in your word so that when we are presented with temptation or when when we are confronted or or perhaps when we're in a situation where we just don't know what to do, we will be able to discern according to the word that has been tucked away in our hearts what is that good and perfect will of God. Lord, I pray for those who are sick. We lift up Paige to you, Noel's mother. Lord, there are others right now who have things that they're suffering through that perhaps they have not shared. We lift them up to you as well. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much. We love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen.